I'm going to talk today just a little bit on machine learning, surveillance, and the politics of visibility. Um, I know these terms are often conflated sometimes the idea of machine learning and artificial intelligence, also with pattern recognition, so on and so forth. Um, but I won't get into the nuances of that. Um, but I will be using both terms, but I want to sort of preface this, that they are, they are actually distinct um, fields that are separated based on their research aims. Um, but, it, but to that level, it really doesn't have too much of an impact on what I would like to present to you today. Um, but what I'd like to start with, this thing is quite odd. What I'd like to begin with um, are two examples on the use of data, transparency and, and bias. Both are stories about aspiration or the hope and ambition of achieving something. Um, here in the first is in 2016, graduate researcher Joy Bulamwini began developing what she calls the Aspire Mirror a device produced at the MIT Media Lab that enables you to, quote, look at yourself, as she describes it, and, quote, see a reflection on your face based on what inspires you or what you hope to empathize with. So, of course, in this example that Joy uses, her facial recognition software um, and her aspirations actually in, in materialize into a type of animalism. So here we have a lion. Um, the mirror is comprised of a combination of software libraries that use facial recognition analysis to convert a user's face into a fu futuristic scene or painting, as Joy calls it, based on the user's inspirations. However, Builamwini encountered a problem. During testing, she discovered that the machine could not detect her face. Her dark skin tones were incalculable to the facial recognition analysis software. So in order to test her device, Bawalawini had to wear a white mask so that the library would recognize a face, even if it was not her face. And this particular library, which is a very common library used for facial recognition software, are ones that are preconditioned to the recognition of certain computable color contrast, shadows, features, and recognizable dimensions. And more so, as Balamwini is pointing out in her research, is primarily associated with Caucasian features. Um, by way of, um, by the way, the intro slide that I gave to this talk um, is actually a a, the result of a work of art by artist Ryo Ikishiro, um, and who also uses facial recognition analysis um, to think about different engagements with race. And here, um, what the facial recognition does is it, it combines with the sonic intervention. So if it actually recognizes darker skin tones, it would play a Kanye West song. And if it recognized non skin tones not of color, then it would actually play, I believe it was Bach. So, and then it would sort of print out your, your trajectory that's there. Um, but the complexity, to return to Balawini's example, the complexity of these types of attempts to quantify ambition um, is a single matter on its own, um, which I will perhaps have time to address um, in the panel later on today. Um, another are the terms under which someone is made visible and the consequences thereof. Bualamwini is not the first to discover that without appropriate light conditions, these routines can execute non-white or socially normalized skin tones and or physiological features. Many programmers like Bualamwini use either existing or bespoke coding libraries to perform racial, racial facial recognition analysis tasks. A coding library, as you may know, is a collection of, ex of executable routines. They organize a variety of types of data to implement computational behaviors. The specific libraries in this example are trained on what is often called a normalized spectrum of data. Put another way, data that are regressed or cleaned, as we would say mathematically, to reduce noise and contingency, thus producing normalized curves. These are just sort of simple, very simple curves, and the tech heads in the room and the mathematicians will completely laugh at me for these curves, but they're just, they're just illustrative in nature, and one are the weighted fits to non-normalized data, um, and the second are the relative weighting and weighting by 
um, just on the actual priority that is given um, and how the normalized curve works in, in the production of data. But more so, I'm not going to show you sort of a machine learning algorithm at this point. Um, just we could sort of think of this version as a sort of truncated version of a machine learning algorithm. But I like to sort of demonstrate the functionality and the operational mode of the algorithms that we talk about because we often take for granted. I think Ben was alluding to earlier about taking for granted that AI is some type of abstraction that is not connected to the social, political, and economic realities that we live in. But I like to actually show the aesthetics of this abstraction. Because many times when we're talking about data politics or algorithmic bias or any sort of computational logics, we sort of take for granted that we're actually talking about maths. And so when we engage on a social, political level when thinking about terms of exclusion, terms of racism, and, and other sort of biases, it's helpful to think about the mediation of those social constructs through the function of symbolic mathematics. But without this sort of mediation, it is believed that machine learning, in this case for facial recognition analysis, can produce insights into processes and behaviors that have been previously unseen or unrealized while also illuminating individual and collective behaviors. In many instances, it is hoped that these insights might materialize into new ways of seeing the previously unseen. It is also thought to close perceived gaps between assigned objectives and efficient or successful operations. We can think here in terms of, as we've seen today, in terms of work, leisure, government administration, security, militarization, health, commercial operations, and so on. But this leads me to the second example. The image you see here is of 94 illegal immigrants detained by Mexican authorities, including 19 from the Indian subcontinent, packed into a truck bound for the U.S. border. Authorities claimed the migrants were traveling in, quote, inhumane conditions. The driver was apprehended and charged with human trafficking. The migrants, however, were not allowed to continue their journey under humane conditions, but were returned to their nations of origin. This under increased political pressures from the United States to deter illegal crossings by migrants and potential asylum seekers. This type of digital epidermalization, as Simone Brown would call it, is a method by which power is exercised through surveillance and other technologies. Brown also alerts us to how discourse on these types of surveillance technologies are investigated without thorough, if any, insight into how these technologies are shaped by our cultural and often racialized perceptions. According to Rob Kitchen, this is also illustrative, illustrative of what we might call a data revolution. In the last decade, the use of data for surveillance has risen exponentially. Numerous institutions around the world are turning to data analytics to gain a more granular view of individuals and communities, as well as broader social, political, economic, and ecological environments. This is made operational most readily via machine learning and artificial intelligence algorithms, which of course underpin modern um, facial recognition softwares. These examples are two of many recent realizations by practitioners, analysts, journalists, and scholars working in machine learning, data, artificial intelligence, and other computational fields. Questions are now being raised in terms of bias and discrimination. Can an algorithm be racist? What do these types of computational biases reveal about our current understandings of one another, including our ingrained social codes and perceptions? Also, how do we reconcile a future that includes data with the literal weight of a potential loss of aspirations? But I want to extend this debate further however, to suggest that what we might call or might consider algorithmic bias is based on the fundamental principle of, of mathematics, as I stated before, which is already predicated on the reduction of chance and contingency, namely to regress to clean, to normalize the unexpected, and therefore 
normalize and exclude the opportunities that live outside of the lines of political engagement. While most algorithms are comprised of increasingly sophisticated techniques that attempt to reduce probabilities for bias, so for example, Baldwini and others are currently working to include different types of diverse faces into facial recognition analysis software, something that she calls you know, reversing the coded gaze. But it, what it perhaps takes for granted is the simultaneous effect of making visible those whose aspirations are to remain unseen by power. So here I'm thinking through, you know, perhaps Glissant's sense of opacity, where what Glissant calls the chaos monde is a world that cannot be systematized, it cannot be captured, or something that Fred Moten articulates as an excess of black being, an excess of living, that itself becomes the production of life. And what I'm attempting to challenge here is the idea and, and the, pro the problem that sort of underpins our idea of visibility, privacy, and inclusion, where in one sense we have a mechanism itself that it's predicated on the exclusion of certain bodies, which are typically marginalized bodies, but also in making that space more inclusive we're actually revealing, revealing the functions of life that may actually serve as the only container for safety for those same populations. So what I'm getting at in this idea of politics of choice and visibility is I want to provoke the question about what consequences are incurred when the aspirations or inspirations of the individual differ from the ambitions of normalized social, political, and economic routines and what will be the general impact of technologies that can mediate either interest using the same computational gaze? And I think that this is one of the reasons why I like showing symbolic mathematics, because we can see enacting itself a very dynamic and two-way system of being seen, of being simultaneously made rendered visible as well as individual, depending upon the system or those that are perceiving the system. Right. So in the case of the migrants, of course, their aspiration depends on them being unseen. But in the case of the U.S. government, in connection with the Mexican government, their opacity themselves is essential to their survival as a nation. But to even address these questions and these problematics of this simultaneous space, you know, in a sense, you know, I, I, I could think through um, Denise Ferrara da Silva and this idea of quantum mechanics as itself being the existence of you know, a particularly racialized space and the idea that it can live in two simultaneous moments where one is actually in reality and another is a simulation. And most of us in this room know this as you know, in, me in media and marketing as our data double, which is like the ghost that's sitting beside us which is actually the body that's interacting with credit systems, that's interacting with capital, that's interacting with other modes of production. And what I'm trying to question then is where does the corporeal bodies sit within that relationship when the double, when the simulation of ourselves, no matter how fragmented or disparate, is actually at odds with our own inspirations and aspirations. But in order to even address this, or even think about the conditions of data, or this revolution that Kitchen is speaking of, we must think about it as a relationship not between a body and an institution, or a body against a body. It is one, I argue, of the body against itself. At the center of this problematic is the emerging difference between the simulation of one's perceived place in this world and the circumstances that inform their current aspirations. And some might lodge this in the argument in recent events on how we can distinguish between the fake and the real. I want to understand what it means to bear witness to this problematic when the gaze itself is not a gaze that's an external gaze, but becomes an autophobic internal gaze that's trying to reconcile our actual aspirations in corporal body with a simulation of what our preemptive bodies might be. And to think about the spatial-temporal 
negotiations of that space. So perhaps at this particular moment, my idea of visibility in terms of me being a scholar is actually very fruitful, but perhaps I want to be unseen as I go in the airport back to London because it's typically my skin hues which are, which are flagged for certain social political aims. So how do I, as a corporal body, negotiate both spaces? And it seems at this sense that actually when we think about certain machine learning and AI functions, the, the technologies to actually absorb that problematic and that neuroses already exist, of course, in the form of generative neural networks, which themselves are designed not to actually capture what's seen, but to actually preempt and predict what has yet to be seen and interpret that into a new form of being. But one could say in this sense that the algorithm itself is what's bearing witness to this paradox. To make oneself and the act itself visible is to show that something is actual or true. As with Balamwini's machine, what one sees in fact associated with what one believes or aspires to believe, it is this process of interpretation in one example of an aspiration for empathy, and another as an, as an aspiration to prevent, segregate, exclude, and discipline. To clean in one sense is to release one's inner thoughts. To clean in another is to purge a chosen body from a particular space and time, and both are mediated algorithmically. It is here I want to return to my original provocation. Machine learning, advanced artificial intelligences, including generative neural networks and their subsequent operations. And I want to return to these for, you know, in this instance, for facial recognition analysis and point out that they are not merely issues of data use, privacy, or bias. They are mediators of the logics of visibility that work freely for the users of power and discipline, as well as for the ambitions of the free individual, which may be contrary to those in power. In either case, the machine becomes culpable, as Susan Shupley might argue, as a witness to these events, one that can mathematically support the functions of interpretation, truths that as we have seen in this brief intervention, depend on how one is seen in addition to how one sees. Thank you.